Good morning, everybody. Happy Thursday. We have an amazing show for everybody today. What do we have, Crystal? Indeed we do. Lots of big news breaking this morning. Uh, first and foremost, the debt ceiling bill did pass through the House of Representatives. We have all the numbers on that and what happens next and also some behind the scenes and side deals cut and all the things you need to know about that. So we'll break that down for you. Also have some big updates on 2024, a new entrant into the race next week. Mike Pence going ahead and giving it his shot. So uh, right. not a big surprise, okay. but still interesting. Lots to chew yeah. over there. Also, a uh, New York Times focus group for Biden. Uh, it was Biden voters talking about how they feel about him. That was bad for him, but in some ways even worse for Trump. It was bad for everybody. It was, so, yeah, yeah. I mean, it painted a very dismal portrait. Yeah. I'm sure one that you probably can relate to of the state of American politics. Yes. So we'll break that down for you as well. Also, new war of words between DeSantis and Trump. Uh, some updates on how American officials and other officials around the world responded to those Ukrainian drone strikes within Russia. Obviously, a very, very dangerous situation. And some noteworthy comments from uh, Congresswoman Ilhan Omar that we will play for you as well. It is our two-year anniversary. It honestly feels completely surreal uh, to yeah. the fact that we were, I was just looking back at our tweets from two years ago about launching, how excited we all were, the crystalandsager.com, the MailChimp. We have a- <laughs> Oh, oh yeah, God, MailChimp. <laughs> we'll save all of this. That we're at the very last segment of the show today, we'll be reflecting. We have a fun highlight reel of the producers and all them put together. But I want to give a special shout out to Scarlett Murray. She was the first premium subscriber that we got. Scarlett is particularly impressive because she somehow was able to sign up before anybody else did. Yeah, we like hadn't hours even, before. We hadn't even announced like we the didn't website announce or anything. We had, or like we had some text sleuth and was an able email. to figure this out. It was Scarlett, amazing. I don't know how you did it, but, uh, but you did figure it out. So I just want to say thank you to you. And also to uh, Christine McConnell, one of our lifetime members who has been more than generous. She absolutely deserves a special shout out from us here today. But really, it's not just obviously without them. It's uh, all of you, I mean, who signed up and backed us from the beginning um, exactly two years ago. So many of you were so excited about the show. And I, I only hope that we've been able to deliver um, on some of that promise. And we're just getting started. It's the very last day here at the desk. Again, we'll save all of our sappy reflections yeah, for the end. That part feels very very surreal though. Mm -hmm. Like I, I don't actually believe that it's real, that yeah. this is our last time on this set with this desk, goodbye to the brick, right. goodbye to the, you know, the very special desk. To the desk, very to the special, brick, very expensive, to the shelves. custom made desk. Yes, Calvin all and Hobbes, stuff. all the decor. Yeah. Some of it will make the transition. But, but I am super excited about the new set. It's a huge investment for us. So yeah, we'll save some yes. of that for the end of the show. We've got our producers have put together a little yes. reflection that we actually haven't even seen yet. No, so not. excited to watch that as well. But um, let's go ahead and get into the news this morning. As I mentioned before, uh, Kevin McCarthy able to successfully shepherd that debt ceiling bill, that compromise deal that was struck with the White House through the House of Representatives in spite of some vociferous operation, uh, opposition from within his own caucus. Uh, let's go ahead and put the final vote here up on the screen. There's a couple things that are noteworthy here. First of all, the House passed the debt ceiling bill 314 to 117. Not close at all in the end. Getting over 300 votes for passage is an impressive feat. Um, the one note here, though, for McCarthy is you actually had more Republican opposition than you had Democrats. 71 Republicans voted against the measure and only 46 Democrats voted in opposition. So he in particular, Sagar, needed Democratic votes to get past, to pass the rule that would bring this thing to the floor. Mm -hmm. There was some reporting, I'll get to this in a minute, that uh, he actually cut a side deal with Hakeem Jeffries in order to get the Democrats that they needed to be able to get the rule to pass. So we don't know, this is like one of those backroom deals. Nobody actually knows what was in it. They're actually denying that it happened, but we'll put that aside for a moment. Let's get a little bit more detail about who were the uh, opponents of the debt ceiling bill within the Republican caucus. You can put this next piece up on the screen. This is from our friend Kyle Kondik. He notes that there were 21 House Republicans who did not support McCarthy on every speaker vote back in January. Per the New York Times tracker of the debt ceiling vote, 20 of the 21 were no on the deal. So all of his opponents in terms of the speakership, right. anybody who put up any resistance to him being speaker, they all voted against the deal. Lauren Boebert apparently missed the vote, so she probably would have voted. I, I know for a fact she mm -hmm. would have voted no. That's what she said publicly right. um, if she hadn't inexplicably missed the vote, but whatever. So um, most of the opposition for this really came from that sort of hardcore group, Freedom Caucus members. We played you yesterday with Emily. We played you some of the comments from Dan Bishop, Chip Roy. Um, they seem to be genuinely upset about the way that this all went down. But, you know, at the end of the day, most of the caucus remained with McCarthy 
and was able to get, you know, he got a majority of Republican votes, more than a majority of Republican votes on the final vote through. And I think there were a couple pieces here, Sagar. Number one, if they voted down this deal, there was no plan B. So then you're actually facing like, yeah. okay, we're actually going over the cliff. And you have some part of the caucus that's like, hell yeah, let's do it. But I think the majority of them were like, that's a little bit much for me, including McCarthy. And then the other piece is uh, Jim Jordan, who obviously very respected among a yes. lot of the uh, sort of hard right, especially fiscal hard right uh, conservatives. You know, he's anxious to get on with his like weaponization of government stuff and Hunter Biden stuff and wants to lean more into that as we head into election season. Um, we're already in election season than this like tussling over the debt ceiling. Well, I will say procedurally, this is a nightmare because the fact is, is that as Kyle Kondik points out, if you have 20 of those 21 who voted against McCarthy in the first place, their entire reason for why they caved and ended up allowing McCarthy to be the speaker was we got concessions so that we can get what we want. Mm -hmm. Well, no, you didn't. You actually all just got humiliated. And like, you know, they were guaranteed all these so-called procedural things like the rules committee or, uh, you know, the motion to vacate and all that. So, well, they haven't done a motion to vacate yet. We'll see. Um, I've only seen one member or maybe one or two actually even float it. Doesn't seem to be a real idea. I mean, the truth is, is actually kind of what I said at the time. I'm like, the fact that when you vote for him, it's like he's the speaker now and he's in control. And now really the gauntlet is thrown to you. Are you really going to do something about it? I don't think so. I mean, they seem upset, but they told their base and the Freedom Caucus guys and all these other Republicans who didn't like McCarthy, don't worry, we have all these things inside of the deal that can make sure that we have all this leverage and control. It's like, well, not really, because every single one of you voted against the deal and it still passed. So then how exactly did you get it done? Like you gave away the store and you didn't end it. McCarthy, I gotta give the guy credit, he actually ended up giving way less of it away than it appeared on paper, or he was able to maneuver them very expertly. Either works, I guess. Yeah, well, they're deal, claiming, but... I mean, it's kind of weird because mm. they'll send out a tweet, like Dan Bishop or whoever yeah. will send out a tweet that's like, we agreed that yes. it has to be a unanimous vote in the rules committee. Right. And it's like, well, maybe you did and maybe you didn't. You don't have it on paper. None of this was disclosed publicly. That's what so, I said. I said, why didn't you write it down then? And there <laughs> were other things like that too that was like, they said we were gonna have, you know, it had to be more Republicans than Democrats voting for the bill for something to be brought to the floor. First of all, that doesn't even make any sense because how are you gonna block a vote from happening based on the vote that's going to happen. Like, that's not even logical, but maybe there was some sort of a handshake agreement. And again, maybe there wasn't, but mm -hmm. guess what? The public didn't know about it. It wasn't written down on paper. So at the end of the day, it proved to be worthless. One thing I was asking Emily about, because you know she's like well-sourced and has her finger on the pulse of some of this stuff, is how much of their upset is this genuine sense of betrayal and how much of it is them posturing for their own base that wants to see them, you know, play yeah. acting that they're upset and they're fighting and they're standing up against leadership, et cetera. That's a real open question to me. I would say the fact that you only have a couple of them, one or two maybe seriously floating the idea of getting rid of McCarthy for speaker, I think that kind of reveals that some of this from their perspective too is a bit of posturing mm -hmm. and is a bit of theater. Because if they genuinely saw this as the betrayal that they're portraying it as to, you know, to their audience and their base, then I think they would be more seriously contemplating those oh, things. Oh, I think you're right. Yeah. yeah. I mean, look, life is a stage, right? I mean, this is especially politics. It's all theater. And yeah. Yeah, they're all like, oh, complaining and all this. Like, well, then you guys, look, objectively, you absolutely lost. There's no app, there's no way to look at it and say that you didn't lose in terms of, not even in terms of spending. They literally expanded the food stamp program. Like, if you're one of those people that's like a nightmare, how can you possibly say that that didn't work out? And then procedurally, none of the so-called back stops that were supposed to ensure your veto power ended up existing. So oh, now it's in the chamber of the Senate. We'll see. I mean, it looks like it's, I wouldn't say easily going to pass. Yeah, but I think it's, I think the action was mostly on the House side. Yeah, exactly. Um, you know, obviously the Senate is in Democratic control. Uh, so you will have more Democrats who are uh, willing, I think, to vote for it there than even in the House just because of like partisan weird reasons. But John Thune had very confidently stated that they had more than enough Republicans to mm -hmm. get to that 60 vote threshold as well. Um, just one other note on kind of the politics of this. You can see the way that, you know, different ideological factions are viewing this debt ceiling vote. A lot of the Democratic no's were from the progressive side. In the California Senate race, you know, you have three contenders. 
You got Adam Schiff, um, Nancy Pelosi's handpicked choice, so she's trying to like make sure Jerry rig yeah. him him in. He voted for the deal. He's considered to be you know more of a centrist, certainly very uh, pro establishment, pro uh, the, the the democratic powers that be, Nancy Pelosi, Joe Biden, et cetera. So he votes for the deal. The other two who are more progressive, Barbara Lee and Katie Porter, they vote against the deal. So that's interesting on that side. Put the next element up on the screen in terms of Republicans, how they were viewing this. 10 Republicans rated as toss-ups, so these are Republicans in actual swing districts, um, they all voted for the debt ceiling, except for one that would be George Santos, <laughs> who, you know, I don't know that she'd really call his thing a toss-up at this point, given that he's been uh, criminally indicted, and it, I think his prospects look a little bit dim, so he's doing whatever he feels in the moment without any concern for the politics of it. But um, So that's the way that different ideological factions were viewing this vote. Um, one other piece that we wanted to share with you here is about the uh, potential side deal that was cut between Hakeem Jeffries and Kevin McCarthy. Put this up on the screen. Um, they say these their offices both deny that there was any deal to save the debt ceiling, um, but there was reporting suggesting four Democratic lawmakers said they had been told of a deal, two saying they believed it involved boosting federal funding for projects in Democrats' districts known as earmarks or community project funding. If Democrats voted to advance the bill, that was that rules vote that McCarthy ended up needing to rely on Democrats to get across the finish line. So, I mean, I would think it was more likely than not than some kind of deal was cut there with regard to earmarks or something right. else, which I think just underscores, you know, part of what has been complicated with regard to the actual deal that was cut in terms of, as an analyst trying to explain what exactly is in it, some of the deal is in the text of what they just passed, and some of it was these agreements that have to do with, in the future, these budget, you basically call them gimmicks, mm -hmm. that the Republicans agreed to pass that would help lift some of the domestic social safety net spending that is on its face cut in these deals. And so it has been a little complex to wrap your arms around exactly what's in this deal. I mean, another area where there's a lot of conflicting information is on how draconian the cuts to the IRS are. This obviously is a huge Republican priority. The cut that passed in this bill was relatively slim. It was $1 billion. But again, there's reporting that there's this sort of side agreement that is actually going to be $20 billion. Yes. But then again, the White House is saying, don't worry, we can backfill that. So it's actually not going to make that much of a difference. So it makes it very challenging to actually analyze what was passed, what it means, and what's going to happen. Yeah, on the it. IRS piece, I actually did a lot of digging into yeah. this. If they, basically, they failed completely. What they wanted to do was to claw back the current initial ability of the IRS to expand. Instead, what they did is an overall cut, which will take place theoretically sometime in the future, the $20 billion, to what yeah. you're referencing. We already did many more multiples of that. This will not impact IRS current operating capacity at all. It also does not include any of the provisions which they talked a big game about, about making sure that they don't go after anybody who is you know, less than $250,000, which in my opinion should be in there, ironclad given the behavior of the IRS. It theoretically cuts it in the future, which I mean, as you and I know, Crystal, what is stopping the government from just backfilling that the next time the Democrats have control. Yeah. They're just gonna do that plus probably times 10. And then we'll have a fake game where we claw back like two years. It's, it's all BS. Yeah. That's why this whole deal, this whole deal to me is just nonsense. Like it, it's nonsense on its face. I guess the only people that got taken care of are the Pentagon, uh, the government of Ukraine. Always, um, always. The Pentagon, the government of Ukraine, and then the rest of us, None of, almost none of our lives are going to change. Is yeah, I mean, yeah. just to yeah. zoom out to the big picture here because it can get lost in some of the details talking about how does the IRS right. funding work and how's this going to go with the budget appropriations process. The fact that we are in this place at all is just absurd. I mean, especially... In some ways, especially because they ended up not getting right. really anything more. That's, that's my key. Than yeah. what they could have gotten through a normal non-hostage taking situation where you aren't threatening the entire glo global financial system and threatening, by the way, like, you know, if we defaulted, then you're having a way. Okay, do seniors get paid? Do veterans get paid? Do bondholders get paid? What does this all look like? I mean, all of this was on the line. This is not a joke and it's not a game. You're talking, you're playing with millions of people's lives and jobs and, you know, their basic security. Um, so that in the end, it ends up as this sort of just like pathetic, confusing mishmash is, it's insulting. I think the Biden White House 
there was a lot of celebration of like, oh, the deal for them is not as bad as it could have been. And okay, sure. But they misplayed this from the beginning. And in fact, it is that's what was surprising was that McCarthy didn't extract even more from mm -hmm. them because he certainly could have. They played their hand so poorly and in were such a weak position. They gave themselves no other out than to pass some kind of deal with McCarthy. But I think at the end of the day, McCarthy was also very fearful of going over the, the cliff, even though he's got these renegades in his caucus who at least act like they're crazy enough to do it. He did not share that sentiment whatsoever. And so, you know, he was also most interested in getting to a yes and averting this whole catastrophe that he was forced into as part of the speakership deal. Now, that's all on him. I'm not like, you know, removing the blame from him whatsoever, but it's not like from the beginning he was enthusiastic about this fight. He was forced into yeah. it. There, uh, I forgot to add a winner, by the way, yeah. in Wall Street, because um, oh, yeah. I don't know if people know this, but the uncertainty in the debt ceiling has spiked treasury bill rates to like near all time highs. And so, by the way, it's a great opportunity for free money uh, well, if you're interested. And you uh, know what that means? That yeah. means like it's more expensive for no, the but, yeah, government to borrow. So really, in the reality, our, all taxpayers are paying out huge premiums to That's Warren right. Buffett and to all these other guys right. who are print, printing tax free money uh, gains off of treasury bills and the now Wall Street not only got to profit off of some of that initial uncertainty, now they don't have to deal with any of the fallout from the debt ceiling. So yes. I, I would be remiss if I didn't say a lot of billionaires were actually very happy by what Very, happened. very good and important yeah. point. And by the way, if you're yeah. worried about, you know, the interest payments and the level of debt, obviously that's wildly counterproductive that mm -hmm. you just spike spiked the cost of government borrowing. The last piece we have here for you, um, just to preview the fight in the Senate, which again, I think is gonna be smooth sailing. I don't think they're gonna have any trouble passing this debt ceiling deal through the Senate, though you don't know. One thing that was interesting, I saw this morning, Rand Paul is gonna sort of get Republicans on the record, force a vote on a, a larger cut that would potentially include, he says Social Security would be off the table, but Medicare would be on the table. So that's a difficult political vote that Republicans will have to take. But I do think this thing will get through the Senate probably without not much of a problem. Yep. However, uh, we did get a statement from Bernie Sanders, put this up on the screen, expressing, I think, uh, effectively expressing here the progressive stance and upset with this deal. He says, I cannot in good conscience vote for the debt ceiling deal. Um, among other things, he says, the fact of the matter is that this bill is totally unnecessary. The president has the authority and the ability to eliminate the debt ceiling today by invoking the 14th Amendment. I look forward to the day when he exercises this authority and puts an end once and for all to the outrageous actions of the extreme white right wing to hold our entire economy hostage in order to get what they want. He also name checks here, you know, the fact that as part of this deal, again, supposedly the concern is over the debt and the deficit, which everybody knows that's not really the case. There's just an ideological agenda against certain of these programs. They take off the table, closing the carrot interest loophole, which would obviously raise revenues. They take off the table any sort of hike for the richest among us and for corporations. That's all you know, considered not even close to being um, a part of this deal. They take off the table things like uh, negotiating drug prices, prescription drug prices through Medicare, which again would raise revenue. So he points to some of those pieces that you know expose the, the hypocrisy and the fundamental unfairness of the deal itself. But also I think the bigger point is the one about how unnecessary this whole crisis and this whole quote unquote deal ultimately was. And Bernie was the first Democrat to come out against it. Jeff Merkley's also come out against it. We'll see how many others um, actually come out on the record. But as you said, there may be some procedural hijinks about forcing votes and stuff on amendments. And we may yeah. have a bit of a delay, a 30 hour debate rule uh, without unanim unanimous consent, but you got four days till the uh, so-called, you know, till the soft deadline, which, you know, you could probably stretch that out if you need to. So very likely not gonna see any uh, crisis, yeah. but we'll keep everybody updated. This whole thing was kind of frustrating and enraging, and I'll be very happy to not talk about it yeah, again for same. quite a while. Good riddance, <laughs> two years. We'll cover it on our four year anniversary. There you go, yeah. there you go. Apparently that's what we're at it yeah. towards. Hey guys, ready or not, 2024 is fully upon us now. And Sagar and I have been brainstorming ways that we can really up our game for this critical election. Yeah, we rely on our premium subs to expand our coverage, to add staff, to upgrade the studio. We just want to give you the best independent coverage of this election, which is possible. So if you can help us out, become a premium subscriber today, breakingpoints.com, or the link is down here in the description video. It really means the world to us. And if you like what we're all about, this is the best possible way to keep us 100% independent, working only for you.